After entering World War II, the American home front needed to be totally transformed to support the war effort. In order to defeat the Axis powers, the American people at home committed their efforts to win the war, and the lives of women especially would be forever changed. The war opened new and exciting opportunities for them, and millions of women were eager to serve and step over the limitations that history had placed upon them. And one mythical woman, Rosie the Riveter, seemed to embody this metamorphosis of American womanhood. But who was Rosie really? And how were women's roles transformed by the war? Well, that's just the treasure we're out to discover. I'm Dan Luer, and this is History for Humans. Today, guys, we're going to be exploring the story behind this poster, this legendary propaganda poster that has been reappropriated a million times and which itself was probably a reappropriation of the classic Popeye. And we're going to be exploring not only the real woman it was based on, but the many women it also represented. So our exploration question that's going to guide our thinking in today's story lecture is, who was Rosie the Riveter and how were women impacted by World War II? But umbrellas out y'all because I got some history to rain upon you first. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, America was thrust into World War II, which had already been raging in the Pacific and in Europe. Wholly unprepared, America needed not only millions of men ready to fight, but the military machine to do so. And to do that, the entire economy and society needed to be reorganized and refocused. President Roosevelt was no longer Dr. New Deal. He was now Dr. Win the War. Almost immediately after Pearl Harbor, the War Powers Act was passed that bestowed upon Roosevelt enormous authority to ready the nation for war. The single most important task, though, was equipping the military. The War Productions Board was created to transition from peacetime to wartime production. It directed the production of tanks, bombers, ships, ammunition, and many other things like shovels and uniforms and medical supplies. Everything needed to fight a total war. The Great Depression was finally over. Factories and plants that had laid idle for years were working around the clock. But with millions of young men headed overseas, there was a labor shortage that had only one possible solution. Working women traditionally were restricted to lower skilled and lower paid positions like clerks, secretaries, domestic service, and textile factories. In World War I, they did experience a shift, but it was nothing like what took place during the Second World War. Six million new women entered the workforce between 1940 and 1945 into high-skilled and high-paying industrial jobs. Governmental propaganda not only convinced women it was their patriotic duty to work in war jobs, but that they could do what had been considered exclusively men's work. Despite their service, women experienced discrimination in the workplace and earned 60% less than men during the war despite regulations that mandated equal pay. More than a half a million African American women faced discrimination on two fronts, gender and race. And women of all races were determined to overcome stereotypes and cultural limitations to prove their mettle. Enter Rosie. Rosie the Riveter was the famed and mythical representation of all American women who worked in defense plants during the war. Even though most Americans today are most familiar with this poster, it was actually this Rosie, illustrated by Norman Rockwell, who penned her into the American imagination. And it was this poster that was most popular during the war years. And this is quite a different Rosie from the one in the poster that we're familiar with. Rockwell's Rosie is more masculine, muscular, with grease stains, but yet still feminine. She wears rouge on her cheeks, lipstick, nail polish, a feminine face with soft red curls. Her face mask gives the appearance of a halo above while she stomps her penny loafers on a copy of Hitler's Mein Kampf. The symbolism was clear. With her work, she was helping to defeat Nazism and the Axis powers. And they were. In many respects, it was American production that ensured an Allied victory. And that's not to take anything away from the men who fought. American power had always rested on its economic might. But during the war, it rose to its zenith. 
The time to complete a bomber went from 200,000 man or woman hours of labor to just 18,000. The Liberty ship Robert E. Perry was built in a record-breaking four days, 15 hours, and 29 minutes. And in Ford's 67 acres of continuous assembly lines, tens of thousands of hands working in concert produced a B-24 long-range bomber every 63 minutes, 24 hours a day. There ain't no rest for the Riveters. And while they toiled in factories, they were also leading patriotic households, supporting the boys overseas in nearly all their actions at home. With limited resources, fighting a total war meant that all citizens had a part to play. To conserve food, victory gardens were planted. So much so that 40% of all the vegetables grown during the war came from these victory gardens. And they weren't just in backyards, but they were planted in zoos, prisons, abandoned city lots, and parks. Americans collected goods like rubber, grease from cooking fat, copper, tin, and steel, while the Boy Scouts ran scrap metal drives. Collection centers provided for much of the steel and half of the tin and paper needed during the war. Americans cut back on all goods to conserve as a patriotic duty. The slogan was, use it all, wear it out, make it do, or do without. Essential items were even rationed. Gas, clothing, tires, sugar, coffee, and food could only be bought with ration coupons to ensure that everyone had access to these limited goods. Liberty limits, the first speed limits, were put in place in a national effort to conserve fuel, to keep it flowing to the planes, ships, and tanks. And as in World War I, Americans pinched their pennies to save for Liberty Bonds, lending the government money to finance the extraordinary costs the war brought. The war was so expensive, in four years, the government spent nearly twice what it had since gaining independence. And Liberty Bonds helped to pay about 60% of it. Though prohibited from combat, women did serve in auxiliary roles for the military. 350,000 women served in uniform. As another door opened, they proudly marched through it. So in their daily lives, Americans were pitching in for Uncle Sam. And it was that patriotic mission that brought Rosie the real Rosie, to step into a factory job once it opened up to women. The real Rosie the Riveter, the woman that was the motivation for this poster we all know, was probably Naomi Parker Fraley. She was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921 and later moved to California. She was living outside of San Francisco during the Pearl Harbor attack and was eager to do whatever she could for her country. Naomi and her younger sister Ada went down to the Alameda Naval Air Station as two of the first three women to work in the plant. She got a job in the repair shop, riveting damaged aircraft to get them battle ready again. And that brings us to... Dad Jokes in History! Why are so many Americans today fascinated by the story of Rosie during World War II? They find it riveting. Riveting. Maybe you saw that coming, but I had to. But for Naomi, the real Rosie, working in the plant brought her satisfaction, a good paycheck, and a patriotic pride in knowing that she was helping get the fighting men home faster. And one day, an unknown photographer came to document the changing role of women in the workforce and snapped this photo of Fraley at work in her overalls, loafers, and her famed red polka dot bandana. This photo was printed on papers that ran across the country, and it was this photo that most likely inspired J. Howard Miller's We Can Do It poster. Unlike the Rockwell image, this poster was not really famous during the war. The poster only began to gain fame in the late 70s, and by the 80s, it had become a classic symbol of woman empowerment. But for seven decades, it was not attributed to Fraley. It was credited to another Rosie, Geraldine Hoff Doyle. In fact, Doyle saw this picture of Fraley and actually believed it was her. And for decades, the media and the nation accepted Doyle as the real Rosie. Then in 2011, at a reunion for Rosies, Fraley recognized herself in the photograph that was being attributed to Doyle. She wrote to the institution to have it corrected, but it landed on deaf ears until a Seton Hall professor's research proved it was in fact Fraley in the photograph that had inspired Miller's poster. And finally, at the end of her life, Fraley was given the credit she deserved as the woman in the red bandana. She did it.
After the war, the government reversed its propaganda efforts and encouraged women to leave the workforce to make room for returning servicemen. Naomi Parker Fraley, as many other Rosies did, left work and returned home. She became a mother and later worked as a waitress, a more conventional job for women. But many women did not want to return home. A poll found that 75% of women hoped to keep their jobs after the war. Ein Saver summed it up pretty well. My mother warned me when I took the job that I would never be the same. She said, you will never want to go back to being a housewife. At that time, I didn't think it would change a thing, but she was right. It definitely did. At Boeing, I found a freedom and independence that I had never known. After the war, I could never go back to playing bridge again, being a club woman, when I knew there were things you could use your mind for. The war changed my life completely. I guess you could say at 31, I finally grew up. So, despite government and societal pressures and propaganda, the war forever changed American womanhood and their roles in society. Women, alongside many men as well, performed miracles of manufacturing without which victory would have been impossible. Though many Rosies hung up their overalls and returned to domestic life, others did not. And the strength and nerve to stand against those pressures and to accept the ridicule for doing so might have come from their experiences during the war, that they, in fact, could do it. Independence fought for is not easily surrendered. And the daughters of Rosie, those rosebuds, would carry on the tradition of their pioneering mothers and spark a new feminist movement in the 1970s. So let's don't forget them. This has been History for Humans. Hey guys, thanks so much for tuning in. And if you enjoyed this episode, could you click the thumb that looks like this and show it and hit the subscribe button and you can get updates because I'm going to be dropping history like a hammer on the regular. And for teachers and homeschool parents, I have resources that go along with all of my videos on my website, www.historyforhumans.com. So save yourself time, energy, stress, and just enjoy exploring history with your students. That's what I'm trying to do here with History for Humans. And if you are doing the learning activity, hang out because we got instructions in just a second. All right, guys, rev up that riveter because this lesson is fast firing. You're going to be digging deeper into women's roles during the war. You're going to complete four stations on different topics. One is on rationing, where you're going to have to plan meals for your family with ration coupons and limited money. Then you're going to be reading about women who served in the armed forces and about black rosies to see how African-American women experienced the war. And lastly, you're gonna be analyzing some awesome propaganda posters. So when you're analyzing the images and the text, make sure you're thinking deeply and considering thoughtfully. Go in with a curiosity to what it was really like for women during these most epic war years. All right, and just like Rosie, you can do it.